little, you know, just a little credit. That'd be nice. Hello, Facebook audience. Scoop with Mark Levine. All right, Mark, you want me to pot you up yeah. and go when you're ready? All right, here you go. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop on Washington. I am your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Been watching the Kavanaugh hearings a lot. Okay, I admit it. I'm a big nerd. I think I saw most of the 12 hours yesterday and much of the several hours of the first day. Um, I don't know why I keep watching. He ain't saying anything. This is the most closed-lipped nominee, um, certainly that I can remember in my lifetime. And of course, very little of his record is shown as well. As the Democrats have repeatedly pointed out, uh, some 7% of his record is being shown. Uh, maybe um, another 1% or 2% got released at 3 in the morning. Most of it came in the terms of tens of thousands of documents in the middle of the night. So there won't be time for the Democrats to read it. Cory Booker. And by the way, if you've been watching this hearing, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, the two of them have just been fantastic. Really, really strong. Really wonderful watching them. Although Sheldon Whitehouse, Sidney uh, Blumenthal, um, not Sidney, uh, Richard Blumenthal, um, there's been actually a lot of uh, my good friend Chris Coons, senator from Delaware, it's been it's been a pleasure watching the Democrats stand firm for their principles. You know, a lot of people know about pleading the fifth. A lot of people have heard that that they know that the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution allows you to remain silent so you don't incriminate yourself uh, if you're charged with a crime. That's one of our Bill of Rights, one of our basic Bill of Rights. And uh, it's true that if you're charged with a crime, they cannot make you testify. And if you choose not to testify, that uh, is not supposed to be held against you by a judge or jury. You're not going to go to jail based on your own testimony. But did you know that you can't plead the fifth in a civil case? A lot of people don't know that. They don't, they don't know the rules on this. If I am being accused not of something that will put me in jail, but – I'm being accused of um, not paying money that I owe or um, some other civil liability. Maybe I um, hit someone with my car and uh, injured them negligently. The point is, if I'm in a civil case and I'm asked a question and I refuse to answer, I plead the fifth, they can just say, all right, we're going to presume that you would give an answer that was negative to you. If you're not going to talk, we'll just presume that you intentionally hit someone with your car. We're going to presume you do owe the money. We're going to presume you lose the case. And you can do that. In fact, you're required to do that in a civil case. You're required to say that anyone who refuses to testify, that can be used against them. Can't be used against you in a criminal case. It can be used against you in a civil case. And I'm reminded of this basic principle of law when we look at the Kavanaugh hearings. Kavanaugh has basically pled the fifth the entire hearing. He said nothing repeatedly 
for 20 hours or so. Now he does answer some Republican hypotheticals. He does talk about some cases that they ask him about. But when the Democrats ask him, hey, would you overturn Roe v. Wade? He's like, I'm not gonna tell you. I might, I might not. I told uh, Susan Collins, main center Susan Collins, who claims to be pro-choice, Republican, swing vote. I told her that Roe was settled law. But in a secret email I disclosed to no one, I said it's not settled law, that we can overturn Roe v. Wade. We can imprison 50 million American women who've had abortions. Heck, if abortion is murder, we can execute one third of all American women. I mean, that's where it comes down to, right? If you believe that um, a woman deciding whether or not to have a baby is the same as murder, shouldn't the death penalty be appropriate? I ask that of people who really want to control women's reproductive freedom. But the heart of it is that this is a guy who told Susan Collins it's settled law, implied he wouldn't touch it, but we all know the truth. When you're on the Supreme Court, you can undo any precedent you want to do. And he said that truth in a memo that the Republicans claimed was confidential and not able to be released. Now, in the past, other nominees have had very little information that's confidential. Um, it's none of this is classified. These aren't state secrets here. We understand why that has to be confidential. And in the past, for example, Elena Kagan or um, Gorsuch or any of the other justices, sometimes up to 1% of their papers might, on a bipartisan basis, after the National Archives determines something is private and both sides, Democrats, Republicans, agree it's private, they might leave out information. What would that be? Well, we don't need to know the nominee's social security number. We don't need to know their address. We don't need to know that their child had a drug problem. Stuff like that. And everyone agrees, well, that's not really relevant and it's embarrassing or improper. We'll, we'll leave that kind of stuff out. But 99% of the stuff is released. In Gorsuch's case, about 7% has been released. Now with Cory Booker and other Democrats releasing things, it may be eight or nine percent, but Kavanaugh's still, case, not Gorsuch's case. Excuse me. You said Ka you said Gorsuch's case. You mean Kavanaugh's case? No, no, no. It was Gorsuch and and Kagan. They would release ninety nine percent. Is my point. They might withhold one percent, but in Kavanaugh's case, they have refused to release more than ninety percent. And this includes some really serious stuff. You got to remember, Kavanaugh is the most conservative jurist on the D.C. Circuit Court. He's not just that he's right-wing. It's not just that he's Republican. It's not just that he's right of Republican. It's not that he's to the right of most Republicans. No, he's the furthest right-wing extremist on the court. No one is more extremist than he is. And what we're learning, the more we see these documents that are being withheld from the public, not for any law, not for any rules, not for any... Um, principle, but mere politics, because they don't want the public to know that this guy wants to overturn Roe v. Wade. They don't want the guy, the, the public to know that this guy talks about a racial spoil system, as if to imply that, well, as came out with Cory Booker yesterday, um, affirmative action, no, that's terrible, that's racist. But racial profiling, no problem, no problem. You want to round up black people, put them in jail, fine. But you want to take black people and give them a better chance at, oh, I don't know, going to college? No, that's racist. You see, it's a one-way ratchet. All of these materials have been kept secret, held from the public. And that's why, uh, well, that's why Corey Stewart did a very brave thing today. Cory Booker, excuse me, <laughs> Cory Stewart. Cory Booker did a very brave thing today. Senator Booker of New Jersey said, you know what? I have a memo, and this memo talks about racial spoil system. And he asked some tough questions of Brett Kavanaugh yesterday about that memo. And um, one of the Republicans on the committee said, why don't you just show him the memo? And Booker said, I can't. You've made it confidential. I'm not allowed to show the memo to the public. And I'm not allowed to show it to the public. How can I show it to the nominee? So he decided just to release it to the public. Let the nominee see it. Let the public see it. 
To which, if you saw the drama this morning, Senator, uh, Texas Senator Cornyn said that Cory Booker was violating the rules. Now, to be clear, there's no Senate rule about this. All this is is the chairman of the committee. And the chairman of the committee has been very clear that he's not going to follow Senate rules. For example, when Senator Blumenthal asked to adjourn the committee yesterday, he said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. He said, let's just take a vote and adjournment. No, I'm not going to take a vote. The reason he didn't take a vote was because at that time, they, actually the Democrats had more members of the committee showing up than the Republicans are. So they would have won a move to recess. But the chairman of the committee, Senator Grassley, just doesn't want to follow the rules. Well, if he doesn't want to follow the rules, then uh, he just chooses not to. But Senator Cornyn, the, the Republican from Texas, was incensed that Booker would actually release a memo that another Republican of colleague has, had said, you know, you have to release it to be fair. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to release it all. Cornyn at that point threatened to expel him from the Senate, to which Booker said, bring it. Bring it. And the other Democrats on the committee were behind him. Now, this kind of food fight is not something we normally see in the Senate. The Senate is usually the staid body, the calm body, the body where everyone tries to work together, come up with bipartisan solutions. We're in a different world right now. Remember why we're here in the first place. We are here because the American people chose a president by the name of Barack Obama who chose a nominee by the name of Merrick Garland, who not only was not the furthest left on the D.C. court, he was the chief judge. He was the moderate, a very moderate Democrat. And Republicans said, under no condition will we ever consider him for a hearing, despite the fact that the Constitution requires the Senate to advise and consent. Well, at no time in 200 years of American history has the Senate ever refused to even consider a presidential nominee. But they said, screw you, Democrats. We want full power. We're not even going to consider your nominee. And when uh, Democrats said, you know, we shouldn't have an eight-member Supreme Court for a year, they said, ah, we can be eight, we can be seven, we can be two. Ted Cruz pointed out, we can wait, we'll wait, we'll wait until the Republicans have power, and then we'll force one through. And that's what they're doing. Only unlike Barack Obama, the current president of the United States, was not elected by a majority of the American people. The current president of the United States was rejected solidly. Hillary Clinton beat him by 3 million votes, more than 3 million votes. So he's non-democratically elected, and he's put through a nominee that refuses to talk about what he would do on the court. They refuse to disclose his record. Again, never been done before. And so for all those complaining, Cory Booker, you're going outside the rules, I say the rules were thrown out long ago and not by the Democrats. And as far as I'm concerned, if Kavanaugh gets on the court, and I fear he will, seems likely, then once the Democrats have a, a president and a Congress in power, they should increase the court to 11. Put in their judges. Or maybe you could just have a new rule that says that no votes count from any justice appointed by any president that was not elected by the American people. The Declaration of Independence says that we should have consent of the governed. Donald Trump wasn't chosen by the American people. I don't think he should get to appoint any judges at all. 888 mark if you want to call in. 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275.
So Tristan, what are the repercussions of Senator Booker releasing those documents? Well, the Senate could um, could expel him, but it requires a two-thirds vote, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, and as Cory Booker said, bring it. Hey, Aaron Ald, welcome. I don't know if you've heard my show in a long time. Friend of mine from Holland. Uh, yeah, sorry, Julian. I should never, ever confuse those two Corys. Um, McConnell did destroy the Senate, Tom. That is true. Yeah, well, I don't know what to tell you, Julian. We need to change our constitution. One of the things I'm doing in Virginia is to get rid of the electoral college, and I'm going to add Virginia to the national popular vote. And I think we can get that done. And five or six years, bring America back to democracy again. So hello, Facebook audience. I've been reading off some of your comments. Hope you're enjoying the show. And uh, we'll be back shortly. I got uh, some info in Gchat for you, Mark. Oh, let me go there. Oh, you know what? I got to do a, a new Gchat. Sorry. Hold on. No problem. Um, I have to... Uh, in using a different if you just send an invite to my gmail address i can okay. just accept it okay i'm sorry but i'm using a different system it's the 2001 mark uh, no, just markgrimaldi2 at gmail.com. Two. All right. Yeah, just the number two, markgrimaldi2 at okay. gmail.com. Right. Hold on. There you are. For more information, go to laborhistoryintube.com. And now the voice of reason in a Ready, Mark? reasonable Ready. world. Here you go. Mark Levine. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the uh, Travis scene going on right now in the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, oh, so much to talk about with this nomination. The first thing I guess I should confess is that I've met Brett Kavanaugh. I went to law school with Brett Kavanaugh. I now he was a couple years ahead of me, uh, so we didn't have any classes together. I really don't know that I ever said three words to him, but I do remember him. I remember he's one of those guys that always worked with the Federalist Society, always agreed with everything Scalia did. Someone who really wasn't one of those people that had an independent, you know, discussion. But I, I, I really don't know him that well. Um, one of the benefits of going to Yale Law School is that I get to see my classmates do really important things uh, like, uh, well, Senator Chris Coons, who's up there from Delaware, my classmate, whom I do know well, and is, I think is doing a great job. I got another classmate who's United States Senator and another one who's the current FBI director, actually. Uh, sorry, no mean to brag. The point is, is that Brett Kavanaugh is a highly educated person. He ain't dumb. And so when he claims not to remember talking with Trump lawyers or not to remember if he um, interviewed various judges for the bench or when he claims that, you know, he can talk about some cases but not other cases, he's, he's dodging. He's weaving. He's not stupid. And it's really sad that we've reached this point. I mean, it's gotten to the point where Democrats have to break fundamental norms to fight the Republicans who've broken fundamental norms. Kind of like when you're, I don't know, boxing and someone kicks you below the belt. Well, they've broken the rules. And if you don't kick back below the belt and you only follow the rules, you're going to get beaten up pretty badly. So it's a shame. It's a shame that this is leading to tit for tat. It's a shame that we're defend descending down this road. It's a shame that people like me are actively, seriously discussing increasing our Supreme Court to 11 members 
to undo the stain of what the Republicans have done. But let's not underestimate the power of a full right-wing conservative five to four Supreme Court majority. We mostly had it with Kennedy. Kennedy was a right-wing judge. It used to be O'Connor was the middle judge. Remember that? And she was a, a conservative Republican. And Kennedy was a more a conservative Republican, and Kavanaugh is an extreme Republican. And nowhere was this clearer than I think the discussions of race. If you heard some of the discussion between Senator Kamal Harris, Senator Cory Booker, Harris, for example, talks about when the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. Remember how important the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was. African Americans effectively could not vote from the end of the Civil War, 1865, until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. For 100 years, despite the fact that in our Constitution, blacks could vote, they were not allowed to vote. That changed in 1965. African Americans are part of American culture now, part of the political, yes, we even had one run for president. But Kavanaugh, it sounds like would take away their right to vote and bring back Jim Crow laws. I'll get to how right after this. My name is Mira Batra. Susan, no show taxes, no place on the ballot in Virginia. I don't understand what you're saying. If you want to call in, folks, 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275. Right now, only the Facebook audience can can hear me. And I do look at your comments in the breaks and respond to what I can. Feel free, by the way, to share this um, live broadcast. We'll go until four if you haven't listened before. So half an hour more. Share it. Let people know that we do this. I'm going to be actually on air a lot next week. Um, not uh, Friday, but next week. Let's see. Much of the week. So... You let people know. I'll certainly keep talking about Kavanaugh. And then I got to get to this Woodward book. Although, frankly, it didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Well, next week, let's see. Monday is Rosh Hashanah, Jewish holiday. But I will be on air Tuesday. And um, what else we got here? Oh, no, wait. No, hold on. This isn't the part of the radio show. This is just me talking on Facebook. So that's why I'm not being as clear as I could be, perhaps. Let's see. Yeah, next week we got You're on Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and, and Friday. Friday. Yeah, that's a lot. Tuesday, yep. Thursday, and Friday. So I want to encourage people to listen in all next week and let people know. Thanks, Mark. You got it. I'll get to Michael right after the break. Briefly, no problem. Sounds I'll good. Get back to the topic at hand.
Starting again in another minute or so. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. Back to the aggressive progressive. Ready, Mark? Mark Ready. Levine. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I am your host, Mark Levine, talking about the hearings for Judge Brett Kavanaugh, who is unfortunately likely to be the deciding vote on the United States Supreme Court, likely to overturn Roe v. Wade. And when it happens, when it happens, when women start being jailed for having abortions, when thousands of women die from having unsafe and illegal abortions, back alley abortions, or uh, rich women go to Canada or, or other states while poor women can't have them, then, then I expect progressives will march on Washington and be really angry. Kind of reminds me of the Women's March. I love the Women's March the day after inauguration. It was the largest march in American history, and it was powerful, and it was, it was invigorating, and it was also, in my view, a little sad. Because I remember thinking, did everyone there vote? Did all of them get, not just vote, but canvas the polls in 2016? Were they out knocking doors for Hillary, or are they just angry after we lose? Are we going to wait until they overturn Roe v. Wade to start marching? Shouldn't we be marching now on Washington? And by the way, you don't have to overturn Roe v. Wade to take, a woman's way, take away a woman's right to choose. You can have death by a thousand cuts. You can make so many regulations that in effect you take away a woman's right to choose without quite saying you're doing so. And frankly, if I had to predict how it will be done under Kavanaugh, I predict that's how it will be done. Shouldn't we be marching now? I mean, there are a lot of brave protesters, mostly women, interestingly. Like, I would say, it seems like it's 90% of the people who are yelling in the back of the room are women. But wouldn't it be more productive if we had a march during the hearing? Wouldn't it be more productive if we did a sit-in in Susan Collins' office? and yelled at her constantly, a woman who claims to be pro-choice, let her know that we're going to work very, very hard to defeat her in Maine. Two-thirds of Maine is pro-choice, and yet she's about to vote for the man who will decide that the government has control over a woman's body. One of my favorite questions that Kamala Harris asked yesterday she said to Judge Kavanaugh after he admitted that he could overturn Roe v. Wade and that it's not really settled, but settled law, but it's settled under current law. And, you know, um, but they could just change that. She asked Brett Kavanaugh, she said, OK, this law says the government has control over a woman's body. I get it. Can you tell me what law says that the government has control over a man's body? He looked confused. He looked up at her blinking. She said, what's the law? Would it be constitutional to have a law that says that men can't do what they want with their own body? And he thought about it. She, he didn't have an answer. She said, well, give me an example. Give me an example of where men would not have the right to their own body. He couldn't think of one. And neither can I. You know, when we look to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, for example, people are like, why do we need an Equal Rights Amendment? Why do we need to say there's no discrimination against women on the basis of gender, sex? We already have equal protection under the laws. That's already in the 14th Amendment. And I say, until women have the right to do with their bodies, what men have the right to do with their bodies, do we have equality under the law? Can it be that what a man does with his body is inviolate, but not a woman. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, by the way, says we have the right to be secure in our persons against unreasonable searches and seizures. We cannot be seized 
unreasonably. They have to have a warrant. They got to have a habeas corpus is the Latin term. They got to have proof that we've done something criminal before they can take us. Well, a woman having an abortion, being re prevented from having an abortion is in effect having her body seized. We need to have more discussions about abortion. You know, it's amazing. And then a lot of these are religious discussions. And obviously, I don't believe we're in a theocracy. I think that people should have the right to choose their own religion. But I've had people come to me. I've had these arguments. And someone says, Mark, but when an egg and sperm are joined, that's a life. That's a human being. And I say, no, it's not. You can't create a human being with an egg and sperm. You can't. Sure you can. No, you can't. Do you know what it takes to create a human life right now in the world? It takes an egg, it takes a sperm, and it takes a woman. All three things are required to have a baby. Now, maybe in the future, Matrix-like will be able to create pods and create babies from sperm and egg alone. And that, on the day that happens, we can rediscuss abortion. But for the moment, it requires an egg, a sperm, and a willing woman. And once you take out that willing woman, well, first of all, you can't have a baby without a woman. And are we really willing to enforce the woman's body for the state? Think about what that means. Are you really willing to say that you, if you're a woman or your friend or daughter or mother or sister or friend, or, can be forcibly impregnated and forced to have the child? We need to have the abortion debate now and not wait for Brett Kavanaugh to take women's rights away and then have the debate. Let me get to Michael from the Bronx, uh, Old Faithful, on, what is it, line four? Hey, Michael, how are you? Hey, what's up, Mark? Hey there. What are your thoughts? All right. You know, the thing is that, you know, before I get to the point I was going to make regarding the hearing, yeah, uh, we got to clear up something regarding Roe v. Wade, all right, because it goes beyond abortions, all right? I know it's a big thing, but... Remember that there are women who want to have babies and they are being forced to an abortion by, let's say, a cheating guy just because the guy wants to get rid of the evidence. All right? So, you know. Well, I don't think anyone should be forced to have an abortion, just like I don't think anyone should be forced not to have one. Like that. There have been, there have been cases in Texas like that. But the thing is, is that. You just said a woman's right to make decisions regarding her own body. Right. That means a woman has a right to refuse to be touched. That's if right. A woman is, if a woman is groped by a guy, that's a violation of Roe v. Wade. If a woman is raped, that's a violation of Roe v. Wade. I don't know it's a violation of Roe v. Wade, but it's a violation of her constitutional rights. It's a violation of her right to be secure in her persons, which is, which is the that, Fourth Amendment. That's so. the whole thing. That's the whole thing what I am saying is that, you know, there's got to be more respect for women's rights. And it goes across the board. It goes, you know, both ways. And you cannot overturn Roe v. Wade because it benefits both sides of the equation that people want to be harping about abortions. It goes beyond that. Now, I, but now let's look at the um, hearings from yesterday where you have a whole bunch of um, interruptions. If you recall... We never had this kind of disruptions with then President Obama's SCOTUS nominee hearings, and we didn't have the same kind of interruptions. Well, the, the Democrats George w. Bush. didn't hide the documents. They 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 allowed the nominees to be judged based on their record. And I was going to get documents. I was going to get to the documents, and it's more to that too. Why are we having so many disruptions? Because it goes as far back in 2016 when Scalia died and the stunt that McConnell pulled were holding a Supreme Court seat hostage right. wouldn't allow Obama to get a final nominee in because that nominee would have shifted the court from conservative to progressive. 
Carlin knows that. Yeah, I mean, in the ironies, Merrick enough. Garland wasn't even that progressive. He was a moderate Democrat. He was a middle of the road kind of guy. Right. But they don't he want a moderate. And let's face it. Um, they didn't win their election. I mean, you know, I'd be interested to see if we can have a bill that says... I'm going on consistency here. I'm going on consistency here. And the thing is that McConnell is a lying turtle head well, mate. He, <laughs> says yeah. he said there's no time to nominate a Supreme Court um, right. to have a No, he lied through his nominee. teeth, and everybody knows this is a pure yeah. power play. Yeah. No, that's exactly right, Michael. Yeah. Hey, I got to take a break. Uh, but if oh. folks, others, if others want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hey, Tristan. Um, good point. I really do need to do a show on redistricting in Virginia. Um, Will it end up in the Supreme Court? I do not think this U.S. Supreme Court will take the case. I think it will um, end up with new districts for 2019 designed by the court, not by the General Assembly. And um, I think the, the court will draw the lines after we fail to do anything by October 30th. That's the bottom line. If you want to know more about it, though, I've actually um, – I you should be on my email list, Tristan, and I, I've said it to you. But otherwise, it's on Blue Virginia – BlueVirginia.us. Um, I they they have a piece that I wrote about it. You can read some of the details there. But you're right. I probably should do a show on it. I need to make it broader than just Virginia. Might talk about North Carolina redistricting as well. One of the things I want to talk about with Kavanaugh is how uninterested he is, and that's putting it nicely, in allowing African Americans to have the right to vote. Um, and that relates to redistricting, that relates to the Voting Rights Act. I'll definitely get back to that. Mark, you said you've got the Harris audio. Which Harris audio? When you referred to her questioning Kavanaugh about laws regarding a man's body and he was stumped. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, let's play that. I'll play it out of the break. Play, play it out of the break. Wonderful. You got it. He was totally stumped. That was great. It was, it was beautiful. I remember watching it. It's still good audio, but the video is even better because you look at the expression know, on his face like, and like, he's, he's like, just like, dumbfounded. Right, exactly. It's a great question. He goes, uh, I thought you were maybe talking about medical procedures. Yeah. It's like, all right, Homer Simpson. Where did, what if, okay. <laughs> now, I want you to get another clip for me, though, if there's time. Sure. Uh, the clip from um, this morning where John Cornyn is saying um, that, you know, Cory Booker ought to be punished. And he was, and he says, bring it on. Bring it. Bring Got it. it. I'll yeah. find it. It's kind of hard to catch it because he kind of says it under his breath. All right. I'll find it. Give me, yeah. give me, I'm going to go do All it right. now. I got two okay. minutes here. All right. I, I'll tell you. I always like Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, but after today, either one of them would just be, oh, an awesome president. I either totally agree. Them, either one of them. Oh, my God. Oh. It's not just that they're very smart. The other ones are smart, but they take the fight to the Republicans in a way that most Which is so Democrats necessary more than ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I don't know. Kamala Harris has this look in her eyes like, you idiot. We oh, yeah. Just, just She's totally in control of the oh, moment. Oh, my God. Just, just these daggers. They're just beautiful. She looks at him like, like she'll even say, you know, well, I'm disappointed in your answer. Like, like, like you know, like a school teacher. Like, you, I mean, Son, you should know better. <laughs> I love it. Mm. And Corey Stewart, uh, why do I say that? I should have got to stop saying that. Corey Booker. Corey Stewart's on my mind. Corey Stewart, by the way, is the right wing confederate. Yeah, from Virginia. You from Virginia. him on Laura Ingram's right. show. He's a terrible, terrible human. Real quick, let me tell you. Go um, ahead. I've got it. It's thirty. I've got both. This okay. one, the Booker wants forty seconds. The Harris one is forty-eight. So All why right. do you want to play him? Go play out of Harris because we started there. Got it. And I'll have the other one ready. I'll have the other one ready.
The other thing, Tristan, while you're listening to me, if you go to markfordelegate.com, M-A-R-K-F-O-R, delegate.com, um, every one of my emails is eventually archived there. I don't know if the latest one is yet, but eventually it will be. Can you think of any laws that give government the power to make decisions about uh, the male body? Uh, I'm happy to answer a uh, more specific question. Male versus female. There are um, medical procedures. Okay. Uh, that the government get, that the government has the power to make a decision about a man's oh, body. I thought you were asking about medical procedures no, that are unique to I, men. I can. I, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Can you think of any laws that give the government the power to make? decisions about the male body i'm not a i'm not a thinking of any right now senator senator kamala harris for president of the united states i mean he just wasn't prepared for that one was he and yet it's really basic when it comes to women rights to choose that was oh that was beautiful god cheers to kamala harris the other thing that i think um she was really good on and this was again yesterday. And by the way, I'm probably the only one watching yesterday. CNN had long said, stop covering it. I'm, you know, watching C-SPAN 2 at 9 p.m. or whatever. Um, <laughs> and she asked him about the decision by the United States Supreme Court to gut the Voting Rights Act. To take this law, this law that more than any other law gave African Americans the right to vote. You're going to say, Mark, after the Civil War, there's a constitutional amendment that gave African Americans the right to vote. I'm like, I know, but they ignored that one for 100 years in the Jim Crow laws of the South. What gave African Americans the real practical right to vote, not the theoretical legal right to vote, was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That's what Martin Luther King was marching for. That's what Lyndon Johnson signed. That's what he said would turn the South over to the Republican Party for a generation. The only thing he was wrong about is it's more like two generations. Lost the Dixiecrats and, um, well, they went to the Republican Party. But the Voting Rights Act of 1965 worked really well for 50 years. It, even though Republicans in the South did everything they could to take blacks' voting rights away, it had to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department and these little tricks and, you know, like they, you, you know, in the Jim Crow era, they would have people guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, or they would have poll taxes or literacy tests, or even actually grandfather clauses. You know, that's where a grandfather clause comes from. You ever heard that expression? They're getting grandfathered in. When the South had literacy tests, they would ask people to read the constitution and explain habeas corpus, ask uneducated people to explain habeas corpus. They only asked the blacks to do it. They didn't ask the poor, also uneducated whites to do it because they wanted their votes. And, well, why didn't they ask the whites? They said because the whites, if your grandfather was registered to vote, then you didn't have to do it. Because in 1900, if your grandfather was white, he could be on the voting rolls. If your grandfather was black, he wouldn't be. That's where the grandfather clause comes from. We use it all the time in an innocuous way, but it's actually a very racist thing. Anyway, when Kamala Harris was asking him about the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, and he said, well, Congress should just pass it again. Think about that. Congress passes the law. They pass it, by the way, 98 to zero. The Supreme Court says, we don't like the law. We want to encourage racist voting patterns. We want to bring back Jim Crow. We don't give a damn what the people want. Their elected representatives. We're the super court. We're the tyrant. We're going to say, no, blacks, you can't vote. And if you want to let them vote, you got to pass that law all over again. Took them 100 years to pass it the first time, by the way. 100 years. Yeah, just pass it again. And so she said to him, are you aware that within months, within months of this law being gutted by the U.S. Supreme Court, that racist laws to take away African-Americans' rights to vote were passed in North Carolina and Alabama and Mississippi and Texas and some five other states she mentioned? He wasn't aware. He wasn't even aware of North Carolina. 
We've done shows on North Carolina. Brett Kavanaugh is not stupid or unaware. He wasn't aware. She asked him if he was aware of the Georgia scheme to take away 90% of the voting precincts in a majority African-American county where people would have to drive 100 miles and they don't have transportation and would just lose their right to vote. I've done shows on that. I've done Facebook posts on that. Brett Kavanaugh was unaware. I guess among his friends and colleagues, they just don't talk about things like that openly. It's probably in the 102,000 pages that they won't disclose to us. That's where you probably hear the schemes about denying blacks the right to vote and how much it will help the Republican Party if we can just keep those, I won't use the word, from voting. And that's why Cory Booker was so brave today. He said, you know what? I'm going to just disclose the document. And I'm recognizing that it might be against the rules of this committee, but you know what? The American people have a right to know. And this stuff isn't classified. And it wasn't done on a bipartisan basis the way it was done in the past. It wasn't done through the National Archives the way it was done in the past. You're breaking the rules. Then I don't have to follow your rules. And when he was threatened by Texas Senator John Cornyn with being kicked out of the Senate, Cory Booker's famous words were, bring it. Bring it. Let's see if we have an audio clip. Senate of that. Rule 29.5, the standing rules of the Senate for the benefit of all senators. Any senator, officer, or employee of the Senate who shall disclose the secret or confidential business or proceedings of the Senate, including the business and proceedings of the committees, subcommittees, and offices of the Senate, shall be liable if a senator to suffer expulsion from the body and if an officer or employee to dismissal from the service of the Senate and to punishment or contempt. So I would, uh, I would uh, correct the senator's statement. There is no rule. There is clearly a rule uh, that applies. Then apply the rule and bring the charges. Then apply the rule and bring the charges. And then, uh, to their credit, a number of other Democrats joined in and said, hey, if you're kicking him out, kick me out too. Now, Sounds brave. I mean, it does take two-thirds of the Senate to expel a senator. But once they trample these norms, it is wrong for the Democrats to try to hold on to norms that have been trampled. And the main norm they, they trampled, and Michael from the Bronx brought this up earlier, is the norm that says the president gets to choose the Supreme Court justice. Because when Barack Obama who, unlike Donald Trump, was elected by a majority of the American people, unlike Donald Trump, had a mandate, unlike Donald Trump, was democratically chosen, unlike Donald Trump, had a legitimate right to be president, unlike Donald Trump, wasn't put in there, installed by a Russian dictatorship, unlike Donald Trump, was not put in there because an FBI agent named Jim Comey was going rogue and throwing stuff out in the public to confuse everyone and ruin the election. He appointed a justice under the rules. And under the rules, the Republicans were required to consider him. And under the rules, the Republicans said, nope, we're not going to follow the rules. We want power. We want power. And we'll take power any way we can. Once those norms are broken, it's really hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so God bless Cory Booker. God bless anyone who releases those documents. Release them all. All 102,000. I want a document dump. If Russia can use WikiLeaks to spy on private emails to try to win an election, certainly the United States Senate can take public documents about a nominee for the highest court in the world, a lifetime appointment, and share to the same extent that was shared for past nominees, 99%. You want to withhold 1%? You want to withhold your social security number? Something that happened to your child? Fine. That's the way it was done in the past. 
We, the American people, have a right to know. And if this judge is put on the bench without us having a right to know, then maybe we should consider impeachment hearings for him as well. This is Mark Levine. I hope you enjoyed the show today. I will be back next Tuesday for more of the Inside Scoop. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network, and here's a clip from... All right, Mark, so I got confirmation for um, the, the obviously the two next week, the 11th and the 14th, but you're also, I just got you confirmation for October 2nd, the one we had just talked about um, as well.